In this lecture, we turn our attention to semiconductors. And as we're about to learn, the conductivity of semiconductors differs from metals in a number of important ways. Let's return to our table of the conductivity of select materials. And on this table, we see the elemental semiconductors, silicon and germanium, which have rather modest conductivities. They really aren't high enough that you would think that they would be as important as they are. But keep in mind that these are the conductivities of intrinsic pure silicon or germanium. And as we're about to learn, the conductivity of a semiconductor is very sensitive to the presence of impurities. But before we talk about impurities, let's see if we can understand what makes the conductivity in these materials so low. So the characteristic feature of a semiconductor is the presence of a gap between the filled bands and the empty bands. We call this a band gap. Now, if we go back to our Fermi-Dirac distribution, which is shown here at the bottom, and look at what it does to the occupied crystal orbitals, we can see that although there is a smearing out, the issue is for the states near the Fermi level, there are no crystal orbitals. Right? So the basic thing we see is that we have just a few missing electrons in the valence band. Those are called holes, and just a few electrons in the conduction band. And so we have a relatively low number of charged carriers compared to a metal. This expression can be simplified. If we simplify it, we get this relationship for the Fermi-Dirac function at any given energy. And then it can also be shown that the concentration of electron charge carriers in an intrinsic semiconductor depends exponentially on the band gap, as given in this relation here. Now, for silicon, which has a band gap of 1.1 electron volts, the number of electrons that are present in the conduction band and can carry charge is approximately 10 to the 16 per meter cubed. Now, let's put that number in context. 10 to the 16 sounds pretty big, but the number of atoms is 10 to the 28th in that same cubic meter. So that means that there's only one electron to carry the charge for every 10 to the 12th atoms. It means that only one out of every trillion silicon atoms gives up an electron that can carry the charge. And so the conductivity of intrinsic semiconductors is low because the concentration of charge carriers is low. So if we want to get meaningful concentrations of charge carriers, that's done through a process called doping. We're going to replace the host atoms with an allovalent dopant. So we could use an allovalent dopant like phosphorus, which has one more valence electron than silicon. And in the localized picture, it means that we have an extra electron that's not needed to satisfy the local bonding requirements. And so that electron is going to be able to move through the crystal relatively easily. From the perspective of a band picture, because phosphorus has one more electron, you can see that we fill up the states in the valence band and we have an extra electron that has an energy quite close to that of the conduction band. And it can easily be excited away from the phosphorus, moving into the conduction band where it can move freely through the crystal. The other way that you can dope a semiconductor is called acceptor doping. And in that, we are going to do allovalent substitution with an element that has one fewer valence electron than the host structure, like silicon. So boron is a classic acceptor dopant. And in this picture now, electrons from elsewhere can drop in and fill up that missing electron, that hole, to create the localized bond here. Or, if we think about in a band theory point of view, we have this state, this empty state, that's quite close to the valence band. So it's easy for an electron to move into that state, let's say get trapped on the boron atom. And if that happens, now the valence band is not completely filled. And so this hole, this missing electron, can move around and carry the charge. Now, the hole, of course, being a missing electron, has a positive charge. So when we apply an electric field, the holes are going to move toward the negative end of the potential, the electrons toward the positive end. So it moves in the opposite direction of an electron charge carrier. 
in some ways, you might think that the electron that comes from the dopant, let's take a donor dopant like phosphorus, would be free to go wherever. But do keep in mind that the phosphorus nucleus has one more positive charge than a silicon nucleus. Right? So that dopant itself is a positively charged dopant, and the electron is going to experience an attraction to that positive charge. Uh, and so you end up with something not unlike a hydrogen atom, the, the electron that's bound to a hydrogen atom. Here we can treat the bound state of this donor dopant in a hydrogen-like manner. However, the radius of this bound state is going to be not quite the same as hydrogen. It's going to be enlarged by the dielectric constant of the semiconductor, which helps screen the positive charge of the dopant. And then we're also going to have a correction for the effective mass. So these states oftentimes might be up to maybe 10 nanometers. So they tend to be quite large. Right? And so this is going to be the bound state of either a donor and we would see something analogous for an acceptor with the hole being attracted to the negatively charged acceptor dopant. And so that's why when we draw these levels here, we put them in the band gap. That is, we do have to have some excitation to get the electron off of the phosphorus and into the conduction band, or to fill up the hole from the valence band. However, that energy is not very large. And here are some ionization energies of donor and acceptor dopants in silicon and germanium. And so what you can see is that there are a few hundredths of an electron volt. Right? And so you have to have that much energy to free up the extra carriers that come from the dopants. And so that gives doped semiconductors a rather unusual temperature dependence. If we were to look at just this dashed line here, you can see that it's increasing exponentially at high temperature, right? So one of the differences between a semiconductor and a metal is that a semiconductor, its conductivity goes up as the temperature goes up. And the reason why is because the carrier concentration is going to get larger exponentially with temperature, right? And so that's going to be much more important than, you know, this scattering mechanism we talked about from lattice vibrations with the metal. That scattering still is present in a semiconductor. It's just that the exponential increase in charge carriers is much more important. But in a doped semiconductor, at very low temperatures, we don't have enough thermal energy to even excite the electrons off of the donor dopants, like away from the phosphorus. And so you have something called the freeze-out regime, where the conductivity is quite low. And then at, depending on the dopant and the semiconductor, but at relatively modest temperatures, here well below room temperature, we get what's called the saturation regime. And in this regime, you have enough thermal energy that you can activate all of the carriers that come from the dopants, but the amount of carriers that are coming from exciting things from the valence band all the way up into the conduction band is minimal. And so over this temperature regime, there's really not very much temperature dependence to the conductivity. And actually, for a lot of devices, this is an advantageous place to operate. Now, as you go to higher and higher temperatures, at some point, the intrinsic carriers that come when electrons have enough energy to be excited from the valence band into the conduction band start to dominate. And then you get into what's called the intrinsic regime. So if we want to talk about the conductivity of a semiconductor, right? our expression for conductivity is going to be the carrier concentration times the mobility times the charge of an electron. But for a semiconductor, we have to think about both the conductivity due to electrons and the conductivity due to holes. They both can add together. We're not going to do a calculation here, but that's what you have to do if you wanted to work at the conductivity of a semiconductor. Now, most semiconductors are intentionally doped one way or the other. In most cases, really going to be dealing with only one or the other of these, depending on if we've acceptor doped or donor doped the semiconductor. Here are mobility values for some common uh, semiconductors. And just a couple things to note. 
we get quite high mobility values for the three, five semiconductors, considerably higher than for either the elemental semiconductors or the two, six semiconductors. And the other thing to note is, as a general rule, the mobilities of the electrons are higher than the mobilities of the holes. Now let's just talk about a couple of simple but important semiconductor architectures. One of them is what's called a PN junction. And this is arguably one of the most important devices in all of science. The idea of a, behind a PN junction is that we're going to have one crystal that's doped P-type. That is, we've acceptor doped it, so there are holes in the valence band. And then we have another semiconductor that's doped N-type with electrons in the conduction band. And now let's bring these two together. And when we bring them together, what happens is that the mobile electrons find the mobile holes and the two annihilate each other, right? The electron drops into the hole and they both disappear. But the ionized species that is left behind, let's say the phosphorus or the boron, that is not mobile. Those do not migrate through the crystal and they don't find each other. So what you're left with is you're left with what's called a depletion region. That's a region of the semiconductor where we have very few mobile charge carriers, kind of like we would have in an intrinsic semiconductor. But we have left behind these ionized acceptors and these ionized donors, right? And that sets up an electric field gradient across the depletion region. So maybe I should point out that in an N-type semiconductor, the Fermi level has to be up close to the conduction band, right? Because when we do our Fermi Dirac statistics, we have a non-negligible possibility of having electrons in the conduction band, but very few holes in the valence band. And so the Fermi level moves up here. For P-type semiconductor, an acceptor doped semiconductor, the Fermi level moves down here. And then when we create the P-N junction, basically we want the Fermi level to be a flat line from one side to the other. But the only way that can happen is if the energies of the conduction and valence bands bend. So we have this band bending that happens across the depletion region. And if you think about it, let's just imagine that you're an electron. So if you're an electron and you're over here in the conduction band of the p-type semiconductor and you get close to this depletion region, right, you've got a charge gradient going from negative to positive. So the electron is going to be attracted to go across the depletion region. Right? So in these diagrams, we always want to remember the electrons want to go downhill and the holes want to go uphill. Now, what's so special about a p-n junction? Well, one of the properties of a p-n junction is called rectification. And that just means that if you apply a voltage in one direction, you get current. But if you apply a voltage in the other direction, you don't get any current. Right, so here we can see that when you have the voltage source hooked up this way with the positive lead on the n-type side, we are in reverse bias, and that makes the band bending even more steep at the p-n junction, and that basically shuts off all flow of current. Whereas if we were to hook the voltage up in the opposite sense, uh, we would be in what's called forward bias, we would reduce the band bending, and that's going to lead to a turn-on of electrical current. So you can use a rectifier, for example, to convert alternating current into direct current because you're only allowing the electrons to go one way across the p-n junction. Another really important application of a p-n junction would be either in a photovoltaic cell or a light-emitting diode. The principle of a photovoltaic cell is that photons come in, they excite electrons from the valence band up into the conduction band, and if that photon is absorbed in the depletion region, now you have a built-in potential that can separate the electron and the hole so they don't just recombine. So the electrons are swept off to the N-type semiconductor and the holes are swept off to the P-type semiconductor. Now, if you're designing a solar cell, you have kind of a trade-off in the size of the gap. So the larger the band gap, then the more potential drop across the P-N junction. It's limited by basically the band gap. It, the potential drop can't be bigger than the band gap. And so we get a large voltage out of our semiconductor. But 
As the band gap gets bigger, that means fewer photons of light can be absorbed because we need more energetic photons to uh, do this excitation. So there's basically a trade-off between getting a small enough band gap to generate current, but a large enough band gap to have a appreciable voltage. And so the sweet spot is somewhere maybe around one and a half electron volts. The other device you can make from a PN junction, if we operate it in the opposite sense, that is that we push electrons and holes into the depletion region with a voltage. And if we have a direct band gap semiconductor, you can get radiative recombination of the electrons and the holes. And so that's the principle of a light emitting diode. Right? So it's just going in the opposite direction of a photovoltaic cell. And then finally, we should say just a little bit about something called a uh, MOSFET, a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. And so the idea of a MOSFET, I mean, this is the main architecture for having a transistor, for having an on-off in your microprocessor. So you have two contacts. The one is called the source, and the other one is called the drain. If current can flow from the source to the drain, then the transistor is on. And if current cannot flow, the transistor's off. So you have this zero one kind of logic. Um, how do you turn it on? Well, you apply an electric field at the gate electrode. Typically, a MOSFET might be made from a P type semiconductor that is doped in type near the source and the drain. But because you have to go across two PN junctions, there's basically no flow of current in the absence of an applied field at the gate. But when you apply a large enough field at the gate electrode, it pushes the holes away from the gate dielectric and basically creates an n-type region here. Now you have a continuous n-type semiconductor all the way from the source to the drain. Current can flow from one to the other, and the transistor is on. Maybe 10 or 15 years ago, there was a pretty big change in the architecture and the materials that are used in a transistor. The strategy from the early days of computers until uh, the early part of this century was if we want to make the transistor smaller, we want to put more bits on a chip, uh, then we have to keep shrinking down the size of the channel. Let's say this dimension L is the lateral dimension of our transistor. But when you do that, the capacitance that you get from the gate dielectric Right, gets smaller. One of the things about a capacitor is if the area of the capacitor is smaller, then the capacitance goes down. So to compensate for that, you need to make the gate dielectric thinner. And by 2006, to get a transistor that was only 65 nanometers in lateral dimension, the width of the gate dielectric was down to just 12 angstroms, right? 1.2 nanometers. And at that point, you just can't keep making it smaller because you start to get quantum mechanical tunneling across the gate dielectric. And so they finally had to change to a different dielectric material. What had been used for many, many decades was silicon dioxide because it's easy to make silicon dioxide on a silicon wafer. Right? You just oxidize it. But the dielectric constant of silicon dioxide is pretty low, you know, only about four. And so by going to amorphous hafnium oxide, which has a dielectric constant of about 30, now suddenly make the gate dielectric much thicker and still get the same capacitance from your gate dielectric. So, so that was a, a really big change that was made in the materials that are used in semiconductor transistors. And it, in my opinion, it made the world of transistors just a little bit more interesting from a materials perspective.